On December 6, 2025, a magnitude 7.0 rupture ripped across the Canada and Alaska border, fracturing frozen wilderness and remote highways. Within seconds, lives were upended, aftershocks multiplied, and critical lifelines failed. Scientists warn the entire Pacific edge may be awakening, and the question is what chain of forces unleashed this disaster, and how vulnerable are the lands we thought were stable? The answers begin where the shaking first broke the silence. Shattered asphalt stretches across snow-bound highways, the surface split by jagged lines that snake through the white silence. In places, the roadbed has dropped by several inches, leaving abrupt steps where tires once rolled smoothly. Survey crews step carefully along the edges, photographing cracks that widen near embankments and culverts, classic signs of shaken permafrost beneath the surface. The cold, rigid ground, locked in by winter's grip, has fractured unevenly, buckling where the underlying ice-rich soil gave way. Bridge approaches reveal subtle but unmistakable damage. At one crossing, the pavement has settled away from the concrete deck, leaving a sharp gap. Expansion joints are slightly misaligned, their steel plates jutting at odd angles. Inspectors measure the displacement, noting that even a few centimeters here can threaten the only road link for hundreds of kilometers. Railings show fresh cracks, and the gravel shoulders have slumped toward frozen rivers below. Utility poles lean at uneasy angles, their bases tilted where the ground shifted and anchors pulled against frozen soil. Power lines sag, tensioned by the sudden movement. In scattered communities, small wooden buildings show hairline cracks along walls and door frames, evidence of the jolt that rattled shelves and sent loose objects crashing to the floor. On the valley floors, frozen rivers bear long, sinuous fissures, ice plates pushed apart by the quake's force. In the mountains, narrow scars streak down steep slopes where snow and rock have slid free, leaving fans of debris at the base. Dust still hangs in the air above some slopes, a lingering trace of landslides triggered by the shaking. Each detail speaks to the hidden violence beneath the winter landscape, where damage is measured in subtle displacements and silent fractures rather than collapsed buildings. Seismometers across Alaska and Yukon register a restless pattern through the first night. Instead of silence after the main shock, a swarm of smaller earthquakes ripples through the crust. On digital maps, each aftershock appears as a new dot, clustering along the fault trace and radiating outward in bursts. By dawn, more than 40 magnitude 3 to 5 aftershocks have been recorded within a zone nearly 150 kilometers long and 30 kilometers wide, stretching beneath mountain valleys and frozen riverbeds. The densest cluster hugs the rupture zone near Hubbard Glacier, while scattered events reach deep into the borderlands. Waveform plots from the Alaska Earthquake Center show sharp, staccato spikes, each one a separate jolt, some lasting only seconds. Most are too small to cause new damage, but a handful are strong enough to rattle windows and send fresh snow tumbling from rooftops in remote villages. Residents report sudden tremors through the night, the ground shivering as if the earth itself cannot settle. Aftershock rates follow a familiar pattern known as Omori's, Omori's Law, a rapid burst in the first hours, then a steady tapering as the sequence decays. Yet the swarm remains active, with dozens of events in the first day alone. This restless behavior is not random. Each aftershock traces the outline of the fault that slipped, mapping out the hidden geometry of the rupture beneath the ice and snow. For scientists, this swarm is both a warning and a clue, evidence that the crust is still adjusting and that the story of this earthquake is far from over. The Pacific Ring of Fire stretches like a glowing arc around the world's largest ocean, tracing a line of restless boundaries where tectonic plates grind, collide, and slip past each other. Nowhere is this more evident than along the northern margin where Alaska and northwestern Canada meet. Here, three powerful geological systems converge. The Alaska Aleutian Subduction Zone, the Queen Charlotte Fairweather Transform Fault, and the Transition Zone of the Gulf of Alaska. Each system moves in its own way, shaping the land above with every pulse of energy deep below. Subduction zones, like the one beneath Prince William Sound, are responsible for the most colossal earthquakes on record. In 1964, a magnitude 9.2 megathrust event struck Alaska, 
rupturing nearly a thousand kilometers of fault and lifting entire coastlines by meters. That quake lasted over four minutes and sent tsunamis racing across the Pacific. Its legacy is still visible in the warped shores and sunken forests that line the Gulf. In contrast, the Queen Charlotte Fairweather Fault System is a near vertical boundary where the Pacific Plate slides laterally past North America. These strike slip faults unleash their power in sudden sideways jolts. In 2012, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake off Haida Gwaii shook the coast and triggered a swarm of aftershocks, sending local tsunamis into narrow inlets. The recent magnitude 7.0 along the Alaska-Yukon border belongs to the same restless family, a reminder that not all great quakes here are born from subduction. Farther south, the Cascadia subduction zone holds its own secrets. On a winter night in 1700, a massive rupture sent a silent tsunami to the shores of Japan, recorded in distant villages as an orphan wave. That event, pieced together from ghost forests and buried marshes, stands as a warning that the ring of fire's energy is stored in different ways along each segment. The northern arc is a mosaic of megathrusts and strike-slip faults, each capable of reshaping the land in its own rhythm. For communities along this boundary, the ground is never truly still. In the hours after the quake, helicopters become the only reliable eyes over vast distances of snow and forest. Pilots fly low over fractured roads and isolated villages, logging each new scar and impassable stretch. With so many routes cut by cracks or blocked by landslides, airlift is the lifeline, especially for communities with no winter road access. On the first day alone, more than two dozen helicopter sorties crossed the border region, ferrying emergency teams, supplies, and medical staff to scattered settlements. In some valleys, residents gather at makeshift shelters set up in schools or community halls, heated by diesel generators and wood stoves. Local leaders, many from indigenous nations, coordinate check-ins using satellite phones to report injuries, missing people, and urgent needs. Crews in heavy parkas and reflective vests move along the few open roads, clearing debris and marking dangerous fissures with bright flags. The cold complicates everything. Machinery struggles to start. Frostbite is a constant risk and daylight lasts only a few hours. Road closures stretch for tens of kilometers, with some corridors remaining impassable for days. In the hardest hit areas, families rely on snowmobiles to reach supply drops or to check on neighbors. The isolation here is familiar, but the scale of disruption is unprecedented. Everyone knows that in winter, delays can be deadly, so the response is urgent, methodical, and deeply communal. Even as aftershocks continue, the work goes on, repairing what can be reached and waiting for the skies to clear for the next flight in. Beneath the fractured landscape, scientists at USGS and Natural Resources Canada begin to decode the earthquake's signature. Using cross-sectional fault models and centimeter precision GNSS networks, analysts reconstruct the underground motion in detail. Interferometric synthetic aperture radar, INSAR, reveals a broad zone where the ground lurched sideways by several centimeters, the displacement field stretching for more than 100 kilometers. By stacking seismic waveforms from dozens of stations, they pinpoint the main rupture plane, a near vertical strike-slip fault slicing through the crust. Interferogram fringes, like contour lines on a map, trace subtle warping invisible to the naked eye. GNSS stations confirm sudden, step-like shifts in position, matching the modeled fault slip. These datasets, combined and cross-checked, allow hazard teams to map the true extent of deformation and feed it into scenario models, critical groundwork for understanding what threats may follow in the days ahead. Hazard models spin forward as the dust settles, mapping out the next set of risks. For this inland strike-slip earthquake, tsunami models show almost no threat to the open Pacific. Wave heights barely register on offshore gauges, well below any warning level. Still in the steep, narrow fjords carved deep into the coastline, scenario simulations highlight a different danger. Here, even modest landslides triggered by aftershocks could displace enough water to send sudden, amplified surges racing down the channels. High-risk fjords and deltas stand out on hazard maps, flagged not for ocean-wide waves, but for their ability to focus local energy into destructive bursts. 
Landslide probability charts overlay these same corridors, tracing steep slopes and unstable headwalls where the shaking has already loosened rock and snow. Meanwhile, aftershock forecasts chart a busy road ahead, with hundreds of smaller quakes likely and a real possibility of another damaging event in the coming days. Each model feeds into the triage, where to watch, where to warn, and where the landscape remains on edge. The Ring of Fire is quiet for now, but with over 90% of the world's earthquakes striking this volatile boundary, every tremor here is a warning. Adaptation isn't optional. Vigilance is survival. Nature's next move is unpredictable, but our readiness determines what endures. Stay alert and stay connected.